The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Vinny Politan, and welcome to the Court TV Podcast. For this week's podcast, we have another audio edition of our original production, Someone They Knew with Tamron Hall, a show that centers around the fact that the vast majority of violent crime is perpetrated by someone the victim knew. Knowing that, it's natural for the police to focus on family first when a crime happens. But this week's episode shows that sometimes that focus on the family is actually the result of putting blinders on and the consequences can be life-destroying. This week's episode is called Mirror Image, and it's the story of the brutal home invasion murder of Dennis Lewis and what led to the police charging his identical twin brother with his death. Here, featuring interviews with defense attorneys Adam Nemen and Shannon Lays, homicide detective Jay Fulton, forensic analyst Melissa Fernandez, and the victim's brother, Darris Lewis, is someone they knew with Tamron Hall, Mirror Image. This is the Court TV Podcast. Dennis was a hardworking, good student, no apparent enemies. What stood out to us in the media at the time was that why these people, why this house? Obviously, somebody out there has something against Dennis Lewis. If we're wrong, then he's going to go to prison probably for the rest of his life. Dennis Lewis was a 17-year-old high school student in Columbus, Ohio. He was active in sports and played the tuba in the marching band. He was well-liked and didn't seem to have any enemies. But on the night of January 18th, 2008, Dennis was murdered during a home invasion. It was a tragic loss that deeply affected his family, especially his identical twin brother, Darris. Investigators had no solid leads until the crime lab came back with stunning blood evidence results. Dennis, he was, first of all, he was amazing. He was more so the extrovert. I was more so the, the introvert. But when it comes to Dennis, it was, uh, there was no gray area with him. He was, he was either black or white. And he had a certain um, je ne sais quoi uh, about him. He radiated something, you know, when you walk into a room, he carried that presence. And that is something uh, that I, I won't forget. High school for Dennis and I, we are two peas in a pod. I mean, we were just achieving, like, you know, it was, it was hey, we're passing our classes, we're, you know, we're in AP classes, men's tennis, volleyball, <laughs> track and field, marching band. That was the main thing for us that taught us structure, taught us balance. The Linden area of town suffered from suburban flight back in the early 80s. It was 70% African-American and 25% white. And, and it became known as a problem with crime and poverty in Columbus. In 2008, Darris moved out of the house. He turned 18 and wanted to live on his own. Dennis stayed behind and took care of their mother, who was handicapped. She had multiple sclerosis. She needed help getting around. On one day, April Lewis woke up to men bursting through the front door of her house, demanding money. They were wearing masks. They put a gun to her head and said, where's the money? Dennis was asleep in a nearby bedroom, woke up to save his mother's life, got into a scuffle with one of the robbers, and he was shot and killed. I received a phone call from my sister. She stated that uh, your, uh, your brother is dead. Now, I have an older brother. Um, his name is Larry, and I was like, who, Larry? And then she said, no, you're twin. And so I dropped the phone, it, it hung up, and then I, she called back, and you know, this is what, one something, two something in the morning. And I'm just like, okay, what did you say? You know, and she, she was like, come over here now. So I literally jumped in a car and went to the crime scene, which is my mother's home at that point. 
patrol officers had responded to a 911 call. The victim's mother heard basically her son being murdered. She indicated multiple suspects had come in, at least three and maybe four. There were closets that were tossed, dresser doors going through. It, it had the look of a, a home invasion where somebody's looking for something. Well, my mother was in the house when, when my brother was murdered. I think for her, it was more, you know, I can't believe it. Um, this is something that nobody's seen coming at all. It was definitely unforeseen. I think she was just in utter shock, honestly. They said, turn your head at a 45. <laughs> I remember hearing later that Darius had been at the scene tape, kind of inquiring what's going on at my house. And then when the detectives went back to locate him, he was no longer there. We found out where he stayed with his girlfriend, and we were able to track him down. It's very cooperative. Darius had a solid alibi. He was at another location in South Columbus. He was in bed with his girlfriend, and the girlfriend also lived with her sister and boyfriend, and those two also placed him there at home. Well, we didn't have much at first. Some of the things that stood out to us initially were that the witness was pointing to us as this is where the suspects came in, the front door. There was no force used on that door, which indicates that, that maybe entry was gained with a key. Somebody that had access to this place or somebody with a key has provided access to other persons. There was a ladder up to a bathroom window at the rear of the residence. We collected that. We did not recover a weapon and we did not recover a shell casing, so that indicated to us that it was either a revolver that was involved in this or that the suspect or suspects had removed this evidence. Althea Young is the uh, lead homicide detective on this case, and as she's walking through the home, she is pointing out to the CSI team um, items that she feels are important that should be photographed, collected, and processed. And in Dennis's bedroom, she notices a bloody handprint on the wall. And in that bloody handprint, she observes ridge detail. And so she instructs the CSI unit to go ahead and process that, cut the drywall out, and they take that back to the property room. What stood out to us in the media at the time was that why these people? Why this house? They obviously didn't have a lot of money. The two boys had no record, no history of violence. They were loved in the community, loved by their teachers. Why this house? It didn't make a lot of sense. About a month later, the story took a dramatic turn. Detectives had very little to go on. The intruders wore masks to hide their identities, and no murder weapon was found. Whoever killed Dennis didn't leave much evidence behind. The one thing investigators did have, detail of a palm print smeared in blood. We held that scene for uh, probably two, two and a half days. There was blood in the bedroom where Dennis had been shot and there was a blood smear on the wall that contained some ridge detail. We actually had the crime scene unit remove that piece of drywall so that we could have the actual print for them to examine. The homicide unit goes about their thing, which is we gotta figure out what the motive was here. I mean, obviously there's somebody out there that has something against Dennis Lewis. Is there some kind of grudge? We found out that he was a hardworking, good student, no apparent enemies, no connections to a lifestyle that we could indicate would lead to something like this. It wasn't a lot coming from the police. It was, you know, little tidbits, have you heard this or have you heard that? I'll say no or, or yes or whatever have you. Again, nothing was really set in stone. Nothing was really like a full-fledged, we have someone here. And so it was kind of vague. The initial theory is that this was a home invasion, what was in the house that these people were looking for. Accompanied by the fact that we're being told by a witness that the point of entry is the front door, now we're thinking, what were these people looking for and who has access to the front door of this residence? It was our understanding there was but four keys to this house. 
and that Darius had a key, Dennis had a key, her mother had a key, and her sister, who sometimes was a caregiver to her, had a key. And so we're trying to put our heads together, okay, who has a key, and what's the motive here? What, what are they coming to steal? In looking at the home, you wouldn't think that this would be the type of home that you would look for to do what they would call a lick. In uh, street terms, a lick is a robbery utilizing a firearm. The only motive that we could come up with is that there was a cousin, Joey Westbrook, who was a known drug dealer in the area and stayed at the Lewis house on occasion. Joey had been arrested a night or two prior to the home invasion. Anyone who might be a competitor or even an associate in the, in the drug world might view his arrest as an opportunity to look for his stash at the Lewis residence. Joey had not been a stranger to the house where this homicide occurred. So we wanted to look at see if, if Joey was storing stuff there. I mean, that was one of the theories at time. I, I liked the Westbrook thing a lot. Robert Shepard Holmes was an individual that was on the police radar sometime shortly after the homicide, bragging about a lick to other students in the school where he attended. I believe he had a firearm that was similar to the caliber that was used to kill Dennis Lewis. It was an old beat up 38 special. We felt he could have further been either cleared or perhaps heavily investigated in order to determine whether he had anything to do with this. So these are the early suspects. And then you have to talk to family. And Darius is as close to that victim as his mother. And they're twins. We all understand in that job that you have a significantly higher probability of losing your life to somebody in your circle than you do from a stranger. Somebody that knew you, somebody that knew what was there, somebody that had access to the house. So yeah, Darius is gonna have to be talked to. The detectives, they definitely wanted to talk with me and I'd talk with them. I would go to the police and say, hey, this is what I've heard. They take it the way they, they take it. Anything that can perhaps help, I'm like, hey, this is, this is what's going on. Anything you guys need from me, I'm here to help. And that was pretty much what I, what I did. During our investigation, we found out that the police failed to collect a wristwatch that was found on the bedding of Dennis Lewis. So it was our contention that that watch was left by one of the perpetrators in this case. And to this day, it is untested. There was clearly a sign of a break-in entry from the rear bathroom window. There was a ladder propped up against the rear of the home. There was a footprint impression in the bathroom. The bathroom sink had fingerprints that were lifted by the crime scene technicians for the Columbus police. And to my knowledge, those to this day have never been identified. Police botched the investigation. We didn't get the DNA back on the blood nor the print back in a matter of days. It was a matter of a week and a half before this information is imparted. The forensic examination of the blood indicated that that did in fact match the DNA of the victim and the examination of the print matched his brother, Darius. He comes to the front of the line as a suspect because that's irrefutable. It's crazy. Um, I'm just like, I'm, I'm literally, my stomach hit the floor. Follow Court TV live over the air, uninterrupted. If you're watching television with an antenna, just rescan your channels now to add Court TV. And go to CourtTV.com to see the exact channel position and more ways to watch Court TV in your area. The crime lab results shocked investigators. No one wanted to believe that Darris was involved in the death of his brother, Dennis. But they now had blood evidence linking him to the murder and they had to act. We had gone a bunch of different directions and then we kind of hit a wall when this print is explained to us by our forensic people that this is, this is in fact a match, Darius Lewis's print. And this is in fact a DNA match to Dennis Lewis's blood. We had probable cause to, uh, at that point, to we prepared some search warrants for his residence, his car, 
and we uh, lured him down to headquarters basically to, to talk about things. It was pretty much decided at that point he's not being honest. The veteran detectives, veteran detective supervisors, county attorneys are saying there's no other explanation. And in my mind, there wasn't either. There's, we've had, do you remember me? We did. Okay. Uh, we've had a month, close to a month, to look at this case and uh, looked at it from a lot of different angles. We've got some physical evidence back from the scene that we want to go over with you. Do you think this day might be coming? Um, no. <laughs> no. Not really? Yeah, not really. There's some physical evidence that we've uncovered in this case that points to your involvement mm -hmm. in the home invasion. They brought Darius in for questioning and confronted him for hours about why he would have killed his own brother. How could we explain one of your palm prints being in the crime scene? My palm prints? Yeah. It's crazy. Okay. My, in the mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. There's got to be some things you got to want to get off your chest. I swear to the Lord. I understand. I was not there. Oh, my gosh. What happened in there? I'm telling you the truth. I was not there. They said, well, you, you committed this murder. If you didn't, you had help doing it. Um, I'm just like, I'm, I'm literally, my stomach hit the floor. I just could not fathom um, what what they had, um, but I knew that I was innocent. It's like, like, you guys have something totally wrong here. So, scientifically, your friend mm -hmm. is in scientifically your brother's blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the room where your brother was attacked. <laughs> <laughs> well, I completely came out of there like I don't I don't get it. I don't like I don't like him for it. I didn't have an explanation other than I didn't feel he had it in him. Some of the things that, that, that I just they didn't add up. Oftentimes people that are guilty of the most heinous crimes. <laughs> had alibi witnesses. A lot of times those people will consist of their wives, their moms, their girlfriends, their own boys. Whatever, he was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's the I was somewhere else defense. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that works. But a time where it will not work, okay, is when there's scientific evidence these people don't know you. I understand that. So they're not out to get you. I understand that. I never met you until the, the night that this tragedy struck mm -hmm. the family. I'm not out to get you. Right. I'm out to, I'm out to answer questions, solve a puzzle. Mm -hmm. It's a mystery. I understand. Yeah. This is what we call a clue. Mm -hmm. Explain this clue to me, and we're going to move on and catch the real killer. If they're correct, and that is your friend and your brother's blood, mm -hmm. you will admit then. If they are correct, I will not admit. Well, what else are you going to do right now? I, I, admit. I was coming to help, <laughs> thinking they had, you know, some huge lead, you know, something they wanted me to see or whatever have you. Four and a half hours later, um, I'm being booked um, for a murder I did not commit. He did come in this morning to be interviewed, and at that point, once he came in for his interview, he was arrested and charged with one count of aggravated murder, two counts of aggravated robbery, and two counts of kidnapping. We made a decision based on the physical evidence that this is worthy of an arrest. He denied uh, being involved right up to the time we put the handcuffs on him and charged him with that crime. I was terrified to be in jail. I'm, I'm 17 years old and going on 18 at that time. I'm in here with grown men, drug dealers, you know, rapists. I'm just sitting in there. I'm trying to figure out, first of all, who's, who's my attorney? You know, they're, they're going to be my saving grace, you know. Um, and it's coming to find out that um, the defense attorney, you know, he said, take this 25 years to life. Um, I said, how do I fire you? Previous attorneys involved were trying to get Darris to accept some sort of guilty plea offer. And he requested the court to fire his attorneys and have new attorneys appointed. And he asked that I be appointed 
as his counsel on the case. I brought in my co-counsel, Shannon Lease. She had recently received her bar license, so she was very green to the profession, but she was very tenacious and hardworking um, and helpful in every way, very smart attorney. I wanted to be involved because it was such a major case, and obviously for, you know, starting out, beginning in my career, this was certainly something that would help me to learn, number one, because Adam was such a phenomenal trial lawyer. This is an individual we both agreed did not have anything to do with this case. There was something about his demeanor, the way he spoke, the way he described where he was and uh, why he was not involved. I forgive whoever did this. Um, you know, it, there. I mean, I'm hurt, but there's there's no anger. I for, you know, I forgive. There's you know, I, life is too short. If you take away the blood evidence that they claim they have, the prosecution had nothing to charge Terrace Lewis with. A little over a year after the death of Dennis Lewis, his brother Darris was on trial for murder. The state had blood evidence that put Darris at the scene of the crime, but that's all they had. What Darris had was an industrious defense team that truly believed, regardless of the state's evidence, that he was innocent. I like to put this in terms of a biblical reference. This was the Cain and Abel case. No one could believe that a brother would kill his own brother over some money in a house. The city was in disbelief that this could happen. Because remember, we've had m multiple homicides every year and none of them are fratricides. So this was very rare to find a brother killing another brother. We're gonna proceed and allow the state to proceed with their opening statement. Mr. Mitchell, you may proceed, sir. Thank you, sir. Darius and Dennis Lewis, uh, the two main characters in this uh, in this play, so to speak, were identical twins. They went to East High School and they were just short of 18 years old. Because Dennis and Darius are identical twins, they have the same DNA. But what they don't have is identical fingerprints. On one of the walls, near the scene, in blood that has been tested to be either Darius or Dennis, they find the right palm print of the defendant, Darius Lewis. The linchpin of the case was this bloody fingerprint on the wall next to Dennis Lewis's body. They relied on this fingerprint. He had to be there. It was a bloody fingerprint. That was the way they portrayed it. You're going to hear evidence, and you're going to see autopsy photos. You're going to wish you never saw. And they're going to try to convince you that his twin brother took what we believe is a, a small stool, a wooden stool, solid wood, and smashed it over his brother's head. And then when they realized he was just too strong, they shot him. You heard about what they claim is my client's bloody partial palm print. One out of 68 prints in the house. That is for them to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. That is for them to prove whether this even makes sense. What they didn't mention to you was that there is a viable, testable, matchable palm print of an unidentified individual on the bathroom. There's also one on one of the shoe boxes right where all the blood was, where the struggling occurred. And there's another one. There are numerous other fingerprints and palm prints throughout the house, but they didn't determine them, determine them to be of quality that they thought they could get a match. We want you to hear the whole truth. And we're convinced that when you do, you will deliberate accordingly and you will return a verdict of not guilty. Thank you. Now I'm gonna hand you what has been marked State's Exhibit Number D. The hardest part during the trial uh, was seeing my brother literally on that slab. Um, chest cut open, and the only thing that I could think of is that was me. I was literally looking in the mirror. As part of your experience as a crime scene search unit detective, have you seen bloody scenes? Yes. Can blood 
be an important, the presence or absence of blood be something that's important in developing and processing a crime scene? Yes, I did. Did you observe blood on the walls in the northeast bedroom? Yes, I did. Did you examine the spots that were cut out of the wall? Yes. Did you yourself see what appeared to you to be ridge detail in blood? Yes, I did. Any doubt about that? No. You indicated that you had cut out portions of the wall where you claim you saw rich detail, right? That's correct. I believe Detective Snyder actually did the cutting of the wall, but yes. Okay, and that's consistent with what he testified to. But out of the 145 photographs you took, are you aware that there is not a single photograph of any what appears to be rich detail that we've seen? I'm aware, yes. Thank you. Blood evidence can be very important in a case and it can tell a story but you need to have more than one item of evidence when an officer or an investigator gets tunnel vision and gets excited about one item of evidence that's retrieved they begin to only focus on that and in turn can miss something that is obvious if you hadn't been so focused on one item of evidence. Do you remember uh, when you got the results uh, regarding um, the palm print in the bedroom at 1161? I was informed upon my arrival for my shift the night of February 7th, uh, Thursday, February 7th. Were you surprised? Yes. Now, uh, was Althea surprised? She was shocked. So is it correct to say that uh, the defendant was not a suspect until such time as that bloody print was examined and identified? Absolutely. Now, detective, if we discount what you claim is a bloody palm print, let's go through a few things here. We don't have any confession from Darius Lewis, do we? No, sir. We don't have any eyewitnesses that place him at 1161 or anywhere near there at the time this occurred, do we? No, sir. You don't have any motive that he may have uh, had that you've been able to prove or that you can latch onto and say, this is why he must have killed his brother. Can no, I, I, not, no motive that I can prove. And as of this time, you believe there are other suspects out there that were working in unison with Darius, but you don't know who these people are, right? I cannot put anybody else physically in that house. Been nice to have some other piece of evidence at that point. It'd been really nice for our peace of mind if we'd have gone to his girlfriend's house and found a 38 caliber revolver in, a, in his underwear drawer, but that didn't happen. And we didn't find blood evidence in his vehicle. So there was no other evidence, but this what we thought was insurmountable piece of evidence. We we're being told by our experts, this is what this is. It was only telling half the story. You would have wanted to cut out the entire piece to make sure that there wasn't anything important in the entire pattern. For more Court TV, watch it on cable, over the air, Roku, or go to CourtTV.com and stream live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. Catch up on the big moments from our current cases and relive some of Court TV's most historic trials. Court TV, your front row seat to justice. On the third day of the trial, lead investigator Althea Young took the stand. As a veteran homicide detective, she provided highly credible testimony for the state. But how would it stand up to Adam Neiman's pointed cross-examination? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to present in this matter will be the truth and the whole truth as you shall answer unto God? Yes, sir, I do. Please be seated. I approached Althea Young outside the courtroom just prior to her testimony. And I have never in my career seen a detective, a homicide detective, an experienced detective, who was, I believe, so nervous prior to testimony. The way I would describe Althea Young is looking terrified and uncertain about what she was about to testify about. You indicated that when you got to the crime scene, you said to Detective Snyder, 
take down that wall or words to, the, to that effect, right? Yes, I asked him to remove the print. Because you knew that if there were, there were prints, that they were important, right? Yes. And you told him photograph it. That was the first thing you said, right? Yes. Are you aware that of all the photographs who were taken, there is not one that shows ridge detail in any print? I have no control over the photograph, sir. So you're not aware? Not from the scene, no. I think what she did wrong was that she never stayed at the crime scene to watch the crime scene technicians and how they were determining what prints and where they were located. In other words, there was a disconnect between Althea Young and the crime scene technicians as to where the print was that she was interested in determining whose it was. It appears that when the scene was processed, they cut out right through the center of the palm print, and that didn't make sense to me. It was only telling half the story. You would have wanted to cut out the entire piece to make sure that there wasn't anything important in the entire pattern. It stands to reason that if there were no bloody palm print of Darius's at that crime scene, you wouldn't have charged him, would you? Fact, sir, was I saw that palm print when I first walked in the scene. I saw it that night, and I recognized it as a bloody palm print. Okay. What I'm asking you, ma'am, is that if that palm print you claim you saw, if it had not been tied to Darius Lewis, you wouldn't have charged him, would you? That's correct. It was two weeks before the trial that the prosecutor's office turned over a, a bunch of photographs that we didn't have previously, including the crime scene evidence. And in those, that is the first time that we had a photograph of the actual drywall, which was the Amido Black, the blue stain that they used to develop the latent print. And it was at that point in time that I realized that that pattern that I was looking at that I thought was blood was in reality the Amido Black. And I made transparencies of the Amido Black slide, the fingerprint slide, and then just the bloody handprint slide so that you could overlay the three photos and place them, and then you could see that Darius's print was, in fact, above where that bloody handprint was. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. I'm going to hand you, sir, what has been marked as defense exhibits 1B and 2B. And that is, is it not a photograph of what is in front of you on this drywall, correct? Yes, one of them. Okay, and then on top is a transparency, basically, that was taken from that photograph, which is has a true and accurate representation of the photograph itself. Yes. Okay, now I'm going to hand this to Shannon, at least to be, you hang on to that, and put on the overhead for the jurors. The big moment in the trial was when the fingerprint examiner, Mark Bryant, was testifying and Adam got up to cross-examine and each transparency was admitted into evidence. Then the judge allowed us to lay those together onto the actual screen and show the jurors. That print you removed is from an area where there is no visible mark on the picture you're holding with your left hand. Do you see that, sir? Right? Yes. You have a blown up picture of what the crime scene investigation unit has called a blood print, and you see no blood on that picture, do you? I see a red substance. Right. Like when looking at that picture, you don't see any red substance on with the naked eye, do you? No, sir. Thank you. The print that they had was not in blood. It was located above that. It was a moment that I, was stunning to me. I will never forget. You can't believe that the mistake was that simple and no one found it. My sister is a fingerprint examiner for the Columbus Police Department. And when they told me they had fingerprint evidence, I assumed they knew what they were doing. And then we tried to talk ourselves out of that thing. For a while, we jumped into the, well, we're right. We're still right. That's just another explanation for this evidence. But our explanation, our experts said it was this. But uh, yeah, it just wasn't what it was. The defense made a compelling case against the state's one and only piece of evidence, the bloody hen print. But would it be enough to sway jurors to find Darris Lewis innocent of his brother's murder, 
Each side would have one last chance to influence the men and women of the jury with their closing arguments. And for Darris, the stakes couldn't be higher. Murder between siblings is not an unknown event. There's even a word for it. It's called fratricide. The fact that they are twins may add some emotion and sentiment to the fratricide, but it doesn't change the fact pattern and it doesn't change that print on the wall. People who love each other kill each other every day in this country. Nobody wants this thing. Columbus Police Department detective says she felt physically ill. They passed this print around, around the ID Bureau and said, have we got this wrong? Is there some sort of foul up here? They double check. They retake the print and they double check and they say, no, 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 no. This is it. This is the truth. What we dispute is that that print was in blood. We want the truth. And you see the truth. Is that they found a print, just like his others, that you would expect to be in the home. It is not in Dennis's blood. Looking at the, the 12 jurors, it's like you guys have my life in your hands. And uh, the studious person that I am, I was still broken. I knew that I had to um, show confidence, but I, at the same time, it's like, I'm innocent, and you can't yell that out in the courtroom. As I stated to you yesterday, it takes 12 people to deliberate. Uh, we selected two alternates for this case. Uh, I'm going to ask the 12 jurors, are you all prepared to begin your deliberations at this time? Yes. All right. Uh, when they go back, uh, we're going to excuse you. you. If you have things in the back, you can go back. The judge had released the, the two alternates that had sat through the trial. And once the, the alternates are released, they cannot be brought back into the jury room because their minds could be tainted by outside influences, certainly on a case like this. I received a notice from Carla this morning that one of our jurors uh, had uh, advised her that her sister-in-law had passed uh, overnight. We had a juror who had a death in her family, and she did not feel that she could continue with the deliberation. And at that time, the judge said, are you willing to go forward with 11 jurors? And we absolutely were not. Right, the court at this time, as much as, uh, you know, time and effort, and I understand that, uh, but human affairs are human affairs. Uh, the court at this time will grant the defense request, will grant a mistrial, and uh, will reschedule this matter for trial at a later date. At that particular point, I'm like, okay, that's a good thing. I know that we were going to have another trial, but um, are we going to test the evidence? Because that was the that was the huge thing. I was approached by Ron O'Brien, the prosecuting attorney for the office, who indicated that he had listened very carefully during the trial to our defense and wanted to know if we could come to an agreement where we could test the palm print of Darius that was discovered to definitively determine whether or not that palm print was in blood. And we did come to the agreement that if the print came back positive for blood, they would be able to utilize it as evidence, certainly. But if it came back negative, as we suspected, that they would dismiss the case. When Shannon came to me, she's like, hey, this is a, this is a big decision um, for, for you to make. Uh, and I was like, I'm innocent. And what else do we have left to lose? Honestly, let's go forward. I was standing in the room in the crime lab when this was being tested. If we're wrong, then he's going to go to prison probably for the rest of his life. Absolutely, I was nervous. I also detected that the prosecution was very nervous um, for different reasons. When that item was tested and I heard the words, it's negative for blood, uh, I almost fainted. 
I actually go in the meeting room with Shannon. I just see her just, she's like, hey, you're getting out. And I'm just like, I know. I just said, I know. Um, and again, uh, everything was packed. Um, I, I was ready. Walking out of the jail, <laughs> it was liberating. It was something different because that was my first time in months, 18 months, um, of smelling fresh air. Just walking out and just breathing, just taking in the, the city streets of uh, the sound, you know, cars honking and my family is right there. It, it was very overwhelming. Um, and it was uh, shocking too, because it, it kind of happened so quickly. So um, it, 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 it was uh, it was like, what do I do from here? Because again, school has always been my motivation. What do I do with school? And then exactly, approximately two weeks later, I was in I was at the Ohio State University um, in my freshman class. You spent quite a few months preparing for the trial. There's a hung jury, and you prepare for yet another trial. For a client who is rock solid and believing in you, he doesn't realize how close he could come to losing everything. That was quite a moment for me, too. It's my proudest moment. No one involved in this investigation did it with bad intent or in a, in a rush to judgment, and I think we're all able to admit now that we were wrong, and uh, I'm glad that they proved us wrong. Jay Fulton approached me sometime after the dismissal and apologized and shook my hand and held my hand. From the bottom of his heart, gave me a very, very sincere apology, and I accepted that. Darius is definitely one of the strongest people I've ever met. And to know him is to really love him. For him to be able to overcome that, instead of allowing that to ruin him, dares to the opposite. One thing I've, I've always kept was God in the forefront. I had to have a little bit of faith and really believe that this was gonna end at some point. It could have been 18 years, but it was just 18 months for me. I just say I'm not built to break. I'm not built to break. I do believe that whomever committed this crime, that they will be held accountable in the court of law. Of course, I don't want them to, you know, get the wrong person. <laughs> I want them to get the correct person, um, do the correct investigation. And just capture the people who did this. That will bring, I think, most joy of a completion, um, aside from the scholar stuff, more completion to my personal life. Currently, this is still an, an ongoing investigation. There is uh, two cold case detectives who are assigned to this and are actively chasing down leads. We do have uh, some encouraging news that we are um, hopeful will finally bring justice for the family and look forward to seeing how those events unfold. In essence, still, I'm broken. Broken that I don't have my my twin brother here. I, I think that's always going to be a void that will never be filled, honestly. Um, that is something that I think for the rest of my life, um, I'm going to feel it. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Camps like survivors killed or whatever have you, um, that still dawns to me to this day. Um, and the fact that every time I look in the mirror, I see my brother, you know, so that is the thing that still messes me up to this day. In spite of what happened, Darris Lewis has pursued and realized some of his dreams. He's on track to complete his doctorate of human services, specializing in leadership and organizational management. As of this taping, no one has been charged with the murder of his brother, Dennis. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew. There you have it, another audio edition of our ongoing Court TV original production, Someone They Knew with Tamron Hall. You can see episodes of the show every weeknight at 7 p.m. with new episodes premiering every Sunday night at 9. 
And of course, you can find me every weeknight from 8 to 10 p.m. on my show, Closing Arguments, where we break down the biggest legal stories of the day. I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for downloading. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.